My friend and colleague, Dr. Don Cleveland, has been an absolute champion in the research on the causes of ALS and really conceptually how to think about this. And so we want to congratulate him for an award that he will be getting on July 4th uh, down at uh, Petco Park where he will be awarded the Spirit of Lou Gehrig Award uh, when the Padres play the Astros. I think we will be beating the Astros, of course. Uh, but even more important, Don's award will signify the important work he's done and the inscription here for his Iron Horse qualities, Iron Horse was Lou Gehrig, and sincere compassion, courage, contributions to the community and commitment to fighting ALS. Uh, I, I'm honored to have had Don, uh, Dr. Don Cleveland as a friend and colleague these many years. And as you listen to him, you'll see why he has been such an effective scientist in our cause. So let me turn it over to Don. So thank you, Dr. Goldstein, for that uh, all too generous introduction. Uh, my task today will be to start from what was the founding of the molecular era of understanding the, the causes of uh, Lou Gehrig's disease and to the development of the strategy that we are going to try to put forward using CIRM support. And shown here is the landmark discovery. It's now from the early 1990s that where a cadre of clinician scientists worldwide banded together to discover the first genetic cause of disease. The, we now realize that the gene whose mutation gives rise to ALS, actually it was responsible for 2% of overall cases, but this, was, this began the molecular era of discovery in ALS. And we now, we now know that there are three different genes whose mutation will uh, almost invariably give rise to ALS. But the best known of these is, is, is uh, one called uh, superoxide dismutase, encodes superoxide dismutase, or SOD1. There are many different gene variants, all of which gives an inherited disease. And work from our group and worldwide has led to a consensus view that the selective premature death of motor neurons arises from uh, damage to motor neurons and to their neighbors, as I will show you, and that that understanding that the defective gene gives rise to a damaged neighborhood is the foundation of the approach that we're going to put into practice to use a stem cell-based therapy. Uh, I should also introduce that uh, one of the key features of development of this strategy will rely on having built genetic mimics in mice and rats that develop this fatal progressive paralysis that's characteristic of ALS. So the first question, and actually it's one of a general, a general question for each of the major human neurodegenerative diseases. In all of those cases where genetics has led us to genes that contribute to disease, the gene products are not expressed uniquely in the class of neurons whose death gives rise to the phenotype, oh, gives rise to the disease. In this case, uh, the, the, the paralysis from the failure of the muscles that can trigger the muscles to contract. Actually, the genes whose mutation gives rise to disease are expressed everywhere, in every cell. And so that provoked the initial question. If the disease, the, if a, a neuron here, this red one, is genetically damaged, does it generate its, the damage from its own synthesis of the bad gene? And are the, the normal cells here illustrated in green, both neurons and the non-neuronal neighbors, if they're normal, do they, do they contribute to the disease process and do they acquire damage from uh, the, the, the mutant expressing cells? So do the red mutant cells, do they generate damage by themselves? And do, the, do green cells acquire damage, normal cells acquire damage from mutant ones? And the way in which Dr. Goldstein and I tested that question, or our teams tested that question initially, is illustrated here by the production of mice, which were mixtures 
of normal cells and ALS causing mutant cells. And you can see this mouse, you can see it's a, a mixture by the mottled coat color, which is diagnostic of cells that were coming from uh, either mutant or normal lines. And what we learn from that is the neighborhood really matters. Mutant, mutant neurons can be saved by the presence of normal, the green cells. And normal cells can be damaged by their proximity to mutant expressing neighbors. So the key question from that insight is, OK, which cells contribute in, most importantly to disease? And so in this illustration, which cells synthesize the, the, the mutant gene product and drive disease? So which ones do we think? Well, obvious, an obvious candidate would be the motor neurons themselves, synthesizing the mutant product. But other cell types could include the, their family of cells, the ones that Larry, Dr. Goldstein introduced earlier called astrocytes. They're intimate partners with motor neurons. Uh, in addition to which are the innate immune cells of the spinal cord, the cells that produce the insulation that allow electrical signal conduction, the target cells, the muscles to, that are innervated by these motor neurons, and even the vasculature. But today I'm going to focus on only two. So if one asks, what happens in disease course from animals that develop fatal paralysis from expressing an ALS-causing gene mutation, what happens if you lower the mutant synthesis in the target the primary target, the motor neurons. Oh, or what happens if you lower it in these companion cells, the intimate partners, the astrocytes? So here's the, so this, here's the actual outcome of the first such test. We're using a genetic trick to eliminate the mutant gene from motor neurons only, but the gene is, is being expressed everywhere else. And if you look at what happens to the time, the age at which these, developed, these animals develop disease, begin to develop disease, you can see animals that express the mutant protein everywhere develop disease about 250 days. But they develop it later if we lower mutant synthesis in the target motor neurons. Really, that's good. That's exactly what you might have pre predicted. But unpredicted was they develop disease later, but the speed with which the disease progresses is unchanged. Targeting the motor neurons does not affect the rate of disease progression. And indeed, th there have been multiple approaches now used to test that question, all of which have, res uh, have yielded the same outcome, which is if you, lower, if you target the motor neurons themselves, you can delay the timing of disease onset, but you cannot affect the speed with which the disease then spreads from a focal onset. OK, so, but what about these partner cells, the, motor, the astrocytes? If you do the same experiment, limit mutant synthesis in the astrocytes, what happens to the timing of disease onset? And as you can see, absolutely nothing. But the rate at which the disease progresses is dramatically slowed. In fact, the animals live more than twice as long after the early, early development of disease when you limit mutant synthesis in the astrocytes. So we can slow disease progression by targeting the, the astrocytes. Now the, and that is our, that's now our strategy. Can we, by replacing mutant-expressing astrocytes, with normal ones in ALS patients, can we slow the rate of disease progression? So how, we, how are we going to do that? We're going to take the, the cells that uh, Dr. Goldstein introduced earlier, and you'll hear much more about in the subsequent uh, presentation, these astrocytic precursors grown from embryonic stem cells, inject them directly into the spinal cord, either at, near the top of the spinal cord, or where, uh, where the, the neurons that control breathing are, and, 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 low, and lower down on the spinal cord where the neurons that control the major muscles, for example, in the legs are, and ask whether, if we do that, will those astrocytic precursors become real astrocytes? And will they now support normal function, improving the overall neighborhood? So will they survive? And will they provide a survival benefit to their neighboring motor neurons? Well, we're, of course, we're going to do that initially, and you'll hear in more detail from Martin Marsala. 
uh, we're going to do that by grafting those uh, cells into these rodent models of inherited uh, ALS and ask, can we affect any aspect of the, the, the fatal paralysis those animals are going to achieve? Okay, and the goal, the goal would be, and the timetable that this team has established, is to, if we're successful in the initial, uh, the initial phases, we, we, we very much intend to get to clinical trial in, in, the, in the fourth year of support from the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine.